All righty. The Wonder Brand Show, much like the pandemic, uh, I've been in quarantine for the last three years, as has this show, but we are back. The Wonder Brand Show, I'm glad to be here, glad to be back, and the first guy I wanted on, this is actually the first time we've done a video format for The Wonder Brand Show, it's always been audio, we did 29 episodes of audio only, hopping on the YouTube as The Wonder Brand Show over there, it'll be on Spotify and Apple Music and all that other kind of stuff for your podcast, but kicking things off, the first edition of the show, I want to be joined by my good friend, and the chief curator over at Art Rapture, Mr. Paul Becker. Paul, thanks for joining me today, man. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. It's awesome to see your face, dude. And uh, <laughs> always a pleasure to be chatting with you. So happy to be on this call on this. If you're watching this at any point in time and you're not from Vancouver, it is a cold day here in Vancouver. So I'm in my basement home office with my scarf on, just trying to keep toasty. And I got a heater on my toes. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like we're in for uh, a bit of more snow overnight from the sounds of it. Uh, the winter forecast is pretty crazy right now. It's I saw a meme out there. Hey, Vancouver, welcome to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> thought it was pretty good. Now, I... I dove things off and I said, you know, Paul Becker, he's uh, the chief curator of Art Rapture. You got the hat on right there as well, AR. Uh, it says it down under your name there as well. But let's go back. Uh, I want to I hear how you got started in all this. So let's go way, way, way back. I mean, I've known you since the mid-90s. We went to high school together. Uh, you got started working in the kitchen at Red Robin. Uh, how did a guy from a guy from Red Robin get to where you're at today? So you went to school at BCIT. Uh, talk about that, and then tell me how that sort of moved to where it is. Don't like dive fully in because we'll dive in through awesome. as we go. High level stuff, man. So yeah, high, high school with Jeremy Brand at Killarney. You know, Cougars. I was great, and then from there went to BCIT and uh, graduated with uh, the marketing management diploma, focused in specializing in professional sales. And from there, um, ended up working in professional sales for a number of years in uh, different organizations. And then I ended up having this opportunity to work on cruise ships uh, and ended up doing that for about four years uh, as an art dealer. So got training in Detroit, was placed on a ship as an associate and worked under what we called principal auctioneers. And those principal auctioneers were responsible for running that specific business unit on a ship, commission only. And uh, I was an associate within a few months. I was a principal auctioneer and had associates working underneath me. It's actually how I met my wife, Lauren, as our two ships would dock in Bermuda. And uh, we developed a relationship there and then started becoming an art team, a tag team on, uh, on cruise ships together selling artwork. And, uh, you know, where I think this conversation is going to go is predominantly going to be around uh, the curation and art aspect of, of who I am in my business, but uh, fell in love with art, just absolutely fell in love with art. We sold anything from sort of little Tweety animation cells for 50 bucks uh, to paintings by living artists, limited edition prints by artists. And then what really captured me was uh, the selling of authentic hand signed museum quality work on lithographs and lino cuts and etchings by picasso and matisse and chagall and miro and uh, the real sort of prize of anything that would come across our auction block was um authentic rembrandt etchings uh even pulled from his lifetime where the piece of paper was over 350 years old so that's what really catapulted my passion in art and then from there developed art rapture down the road so we said, you said, you know, you got an opportunity to work on cruise ships. How did that even come about? Like, how did you find out about, you know, de was it initially uh, dealing art or was it like going on the cruise ship to do something else? And, and that's sort of how you dove into it. Like, how did that all come about? Yeah, good question. You know, my wife never likes me talking about this part because uh, I was dating a, a girl whose father was a hotel manager on cruise ships at the time and it was I went actually back to service industry I was working at one of the restaurant hotels down in English Bay and I was dating this girl whose dad was hotel manager and I was like hey I wouldn't mind working on cruise ships so I actually started through a connection and referral from him to being a crew staff member where I was wearing khaki shorts and overly baggy polo shirts doing bingo calling and line dancing and I'd fun but it was not challenging and didn't fire my business brain at all. And so while that one three month contract, I was like, who makes money on cruise ships? And I narrowed it down to two people. 
One is the diamond dealer who, what we call sort of, you know, the shops um, and, and shopping guide where they sort of curate a shopping experience for guests on the ship, but on shore. So when you dock somewhere, they walk you around and take you to buy nice watches and diamonds and things like that. And then the other person was the art auctioneer. What I really attracted me to being an art auctioneer as opposed to what I like to call the diamond dealer was when you're in port, that's when you want to have fun. But the diamond dealer is working and the auctioneer isn't selling any bloody art while you're in port. So my wife and I and my friends, we could go out, you know, in Mexico and the Caribbean and the Mediterranean and go out for lunch and sip cocktails and come back to the ship and have very minimal workload on days where we were in port. And that was obviously really attractive. And then also a, a sort of almost subconscious level of love for artwork that I didn't even know existed, but it definitely attracted me to that. My parents are European. My dad's from Holland. My mom's from London, which are both art meccas. When we've gone traveling as a kid, they always took me to museums, even if I was kicking and screaming to get out of there. Uh, Cause you know, sometimes kids find that stuff a bit boring, but it was ingrained in me to be appreciative of artwork uh, and culture as a kid growing up. And so that really did steer me into that art auctioning in conjunction with uh, the better work-life balance. Two things off of that uh, answer there. Uh, obviously, you mentioned your parents there. And I, uh, I was going to ask this as well anyways. I know going to your house, they always had you know, cool paintings up in their house uh, and probably not necessarily what you would call cool back in the day, but you know, they had paintings, they had little sculptures and whatnot. And, and you yeah. were always into, you know, the music side of things. You, you took yeah. guitar lessons back in the yeah. day. So there was always a passion for art, uh, even growing up through high school, correct? Yeah, I'd say that. And, and, you know, nailed it with just sort of the, the arts and culture. So I'm a huge music fan. I love film and uh and, and tv shows like high quality work where the acting spot on the director directors really you know curate a, a magnificent uh film for us to enjoy and you know really important too is the cinematography and then with music it's just I, i'm a massive massive fan of music and i did play guitar growing up so as a kid, I was really drawn to those things. And we, we took, uh, you know, a drama class with, with Mr. Must, must, must how do you pronounce his name? Mustapitch. And, uh, I enjoyed the drama stuff too. Like, I think we even with Bart on the beach, some Shakespearean stuff. I enjoyed doing that in school. Sports was great, you know, played soccer, but I'm legally blind in one eye. And I think that impacted my ability to be a great athlete. I'll use that at least as the excuse on why my batting average was 0, 0.00 in my one season of playing baseball. Uh, and I think that's might be why, you know, directed myself more to the arts. <laughs> Hilarious. Now you, you did mention also about, you know, the art auctioneer and art dealer on the cruise ships got to have fun, way, way more fun than the, the diamond dealer uh, out there. So it was obviously a lavish life, something that you enjoyed to do and you had fun, but is it something that you wouldn't want to do again? That's a good question, Jeremy. It's kind of funny when I look at life right now in, in my early 40s, you know, if if I'm financially in a situation where I could retire early and I'm, I'm thinking like 60, something around there, I'd actually, when, when my, I've got two daughters, when my daughters are in college and they're out of the house, I would consider going back to ships, but working on like the low stress ones, which are the smaller luxury cruises that do like the three or six month trips where you're going to really interesting exotic places that take a long time to get to. And there are art dealers on those ships too. And rather than doing like a lot of auctions where you're trying to get volume, it's more about building relationships with people on those ships for longer periods of time and doing more um, seminar based processes as opposed to more sales based processes, more on the art education side. I would never rule that out. But the one of the main reasons why we left cruise ships after four years was we got so tired of eating the same food over and over again. And even though we were fortunate to have a guest cabin instead of a crew cabin where we had room service and a queen size bed, it's still tough. Like we didn't have a window and you, you just sort of, it, it can wear you down from a health perspective by being on those ships for too long. And but I will say this, it's probably still to this day, the most fun job I've ever had. And I certainly do miss it. 
It's a lot of like great interaction with people, meeting new people all the time, working with so many different nationalities of both crew and guests and, you know, visiting a lot of cool places and being surrounded by art every day, all day, and really managing your own book of business. You either, you either, you either starve or you, or you, or you thrive. And I like that, you know, that's why I'm, I've been in sales my whole life is I like the ability of being a contributor and being rewarded for my efforts. For sure. Now you got, you said four years, you guys came back and, uh, obviously that was sort of the start of art rapture. Um, how did that come about? How did you form to where you're at now? Um, well not now cause we'll still guide our way there, but, uh, you came back, obviously I'm sure it did, it wasn't an instant thing, but you knew you wanted to become something in the art scene locally after doing that on the cruise ships. You came back and, and you found a full-time job and then this was sort of a side gig. Like, tell me how that all yeah. worked out. So yeah, I came back from, from ships, got back into professional business to business sales. Um, and then what I did is I just started going out to some of these art events that were happening, live painting events, um, gallery shows, other sort of areas. And I just started to build my local network, which frankly, Jeremy, I didn't have any local art network back when, back before ships. So it was like starting fresh, but just more out of keenness to just keep my finger on the pulse of the scene. And especially being, you know, local to Vancouver, wanting that to be predominantly in Vancouver and came across one guy who I'll mention who I'm still very close friends with, uh, Bill Higginson. His uh, his signature name for art is William, William D. Higginson, who I highly recommend people check out. Um, and he's a phenomenal, surrealist, talented painter. And he started to sort of be this um, uh, uh, individual who could start to build bridges for me to other people. And so what happened is I just started to build my network of, of artists and gallerists and collectors around me. And I'd get hired by some of these uh, institutions or projects that needed an auctioneer. So I'd come into a live arting event and I'd auction off the paintings at the end. Or someone would be throwing a charity event at Vancouver Club and I'd roll into that and there'd be a bunch of art on easels. And I might MC that a little bit or auction it a bit. And what was happening was I was like, okay, there's talent here. People are showing up, but I just feel that it should be done better. And there was something missing and lacking at a lot of these events that I was going to. And so we got a group of people together and we started talking about a possible show we could do. And frankly, the, the way the conversation was going uh, was really about like supporting the artists and I've, I'm pretty, someone might call me a little bit uh, like blunt about this, but in order to support artists, my opinion is that you must support the collector. Because if there's no collector, then the artist starves. And a lot of these events I'd go to are so focused on supporting artists and nothing would sell. And so I was like this, the conversation we were having is like, you know what, I can't even do it as a group with all these individuals because a lot of them were artists and it wasn't really hitting the right vein. And so then I came up with this concept to throw an event that I would, you know, put my nuts on the table, uh, raise money for, get sponsors, hire the curate and hire the artists who I wanted to be a part of the show not charge the artist to participate, which is what happens when you see some of these conferences um, or like, you know, Art Toronto, Art Vancouver, where they're at these um, trade show venues. You know, artists are paying a lot of money to be a part of that. So didn't want the artist to pay. I wanted to focus on selling the artwork, wanted an eclectic mix of art, wanted to bring a street and urban flavor to the table, wanted there to be a bar atmosphere, ensure that, you know, people were having fun, also a VIP night where people would be focused on collecting and then tied a little bit to charity. And that was really the inception brainchild of Art Rapture, which was the name of our first show. And at that time, I had no idea that Art Rapture would turn into a company. It was one show and that it was called Art Rapture. And so I'll, I'll kind of leave it there to see if you have any other questions before maybe we dive into what that show ended up looking like. I definitely do. I want to hear how the name Art Rapture was 
made in terms of even just that show and then how you decided after that show to keep it as the name of the company? Yeah, good. So good, good question. So what happened is, is I found a new group of, of uh, confidants around me that would really bring a lot to the table for this. Uh, one was Dario Melli and another one was Brent May and uh, also, you know, engaged uh, Bill Higginson and his wife Olga to chat about things. And we sort of sat at the table and looked at, okay, do we want, can, if we do this, will I get all your support for this? We're going to have to put in some, you know, man hours into this without making money, but Vancouver needs a show like this. And they're like, yes. And so then I also got introduced to Low Tide Properties, which is uh, a, an amazing sponsor who helps with some of the financial uh, responsibilities to putting on a show. Chatted to a gentleman who's a huge art collector and fan of artwork, Mike Soromokos. So between all of us, we bounced ideas around of a name. And I just got stuck on this word, rapture. And some people get confused with that word, which is okay, which they confuse it with the rapture, which is more of a biblical sense of a word. And I was like, if we get slotted in to the terminology from the biblical sense of rapture, I'm fine with that. But what rapture means and why we built this name rapture is the synonyms attached to the word rapture. So if you go into a thesaurus and you look up rapture, the types of synonyms that you will find for rapture are the following. Nirvana, paradise, joy, elation, um, passion, ecstasy. And so our goal is to achieve rapture through visual art. And so that was a really good fit for this name because we wanted to create something that makes a person feel. And Jeremy, you know, from, from some of the talks I've done live, you know, I really start with this whole concept of what is art? What is great art? Art communicates. And what I think really separates the difference between okay art and great art is that great art truly communicates and hits the viewer in the soul. And that's what rapture is. Well said. Very good answer. Uh, I like it. I actually didn't even know that myself, which is super cool to hear that answer come about. Now, you spoke about the first show. Uh, tell me what year that was in, uh, how that came about, what the show sort of uh, entailed, because I, I believe I was at it. I remember that show. And, yeah. uh, and I want to say you were talking about Bill Higginson, William D. Higginson, and for people to check out his work, he's not only an amazing artist, but one of the nicest human beings you'll ever yes. meet. No, no kidding. And incredibly gifted, incredibly humble. Bill wasn't actually a part of our first show. And, you know, we can get down that path, but we've got some some great ideas for for what to do with Bill in the future. And, and I've been a very large supporter of him and, and have uh, been a guest speaker at his solo shows before which has been a real pleasure uh, for me. But this first show, the reason also why Bill wasn't part of the show, was focused on urban street pop. And Bill's a surrealist, so it wasn't didn't really fit the mold for urban street pop. What we wanted to do with Art Rapture was give people the essence of sort of something raw, something with energy, something that had street and grit. And so what we did is we rented out a 3,500 square foot venue in Mount Pleasant. And... We brought in a construction team um, and we built all these sort of fake walls to hang art on. But then we also bought corrugate metal that looked like shipping containers. So the first concept was let's bring shipping containers into the venue and then line it with lights inside and have people walk through shipping containers. Didn't work out logistically, didn't work out financially to do that. And so we opted for this, this look and feel of street containers by getting all this corgate metal and then we got 15 artists that all were different but all brought street urban you know uh, uh pop art flavor to the table i can't remember all the artists just off the top of my head but we had some heavy hitters from canada olivolo iheart who's one of the greatest stencil artists in the world one of his pieces back in 2014 called nobody likes me was nominated as the second most important street art piece in the world in 2014 uh we had denial out of windsor canada aka daniel bombardier denial is just like a dope pop artist i saw his work about three years prior to art rapture at a trade show and actually you know 
we wanted to work together really, really badly. And this was our, our one opportunity to get it done. So we were stoked to have him drive out from Windsor with a, a van full of art that he, he brought out for that. We had a mosaic artist who's a friend of mine. Actually, this, this waist deep uh, Warhol-esque piece you see here, that's got like diamond dust all over it. That's a print by Jason Dusso. We had him with some mosaic tiling on it where he did a piece uh, that was a portrait of Takashi Murakami. Uh, we had Drew Merritt, a really exceptional artist uh, locally here in Vancouver, who's been a curator for Vancouver Mural Fest ever since inception. Uh, we had Takasudo, uh, Jace Kim, uh, and several others. It was it was just a phenomenal show that brought a lot of of, of energy to the table. What year was that in? Twenty sixteen, I want to say. Yeah, because twenty sixteen. I want to say those. Big and then 2018 was the Olavolo solo show. I want to say those baseball bats behind you were from that show as well. Yeah, we you know what these ones weren't, but we purposely had some baseball bats done for uh, the show. But it may have been the Prohibition one the following year. Or was it not? No, we had. A, a, Could have been Prohibition for sure. We had some baseball bats and. Uh, yeah, it was prohibition. You know why I remember this? Because you videoed. Uh, yeah, big bat, bat swinging. <laughs> now, wearing my outfit for prohibition. There you go. There you go. Now, for people who don't know, you you as I said, chief curator, uh, you have figured things out, and you realized that the curation wasn't being done the way it should be in your mind. Mm. For people that don't know that are watching this or listening to this, what exactly is a curator? Yeah, good question. So a curator, from my perspective, there's many different perspectives on this, but a curator is, is someone who organizes an overall look and feel so that a viewer has a journey when they come into a space. And so a curator will decide, you know, who are the artists that need to be there? Or even if it's one artist for a solo show, works with the artist to create an experience so that there's theme that there's a flow that there's balance so an un a, cur a non curated show would be where someone's just throwing a bunch of art on the walls or on easels with no rhyme or reason a curator ensures that there's purpose and so that the the viewer and guest and patron has that journey through the artwork so that it all tells a story and then it ties together really nicely. So after this first show in 2016, uh, how have things progressed from there? You, you moved on, you've obviously met a ton of other artists, uh, probably what we can see on your back wall and whatnot. And you formed serious relationships with some of these people uh, that have tied to big, giant, huge projects. So over the course of the last six years, uh, how many exhibitions have you put on yourself? How many shows have you put on yourself? What what sort of, ha how have things progressed over the last six sure. years? So we started with uh, the first Art Rapture, which the title was Art Rapture. Um, and it, it exceeded our expectations. So we knew we weren't going to make a lot of money because it was very expensive to put it on. Um, but we, we did profit, which was like a huge win. But more importantly than the profit was that we had a lineup of people wanting to come. There was this ferocious appetite for a show like this that, again, well exceeded my expectations. And I think we had over a thousand people come through a weekend and it was only a, a two day show. And we sold a pile of artwork, but more importantly, a lot of people gave such constructive feedback at the end by seeing how much fun they had and that Vancouver has been missing this. and. They're so thankful that we've sort of filled the gap of what was needed in this city. And that made me feel like, man, I wish I could do four of these a year, right? But it's it's a lot of work. And, you know, I working in professional sales, I wanted to leave art as a side hustle. And the reason why I like that is that it's purely passion when it's my side hustle. So what I love about that is that I'm never trying to force art down someone's throat to try pay my bills it it moves rather than moving art to being purely business focused and profit focused 
it remains for me right now passion focused and that allows me to be more picky with the artists i choose it allows our team to be more effective with the messaging and opportunity that we put forth out into the market and also uh, enables us to not worry about you know whether something is going to uh, sell out or not sell out and what's more important is 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 the purpose the curation and and the the experience that we bring forth so on that note you know being being a, a fully employed individual and a side hustle we decided to do another show the following year and that year we brought in okuda san miguel who's one of the biggest street artists in the world from madrid that was a big undertaking and uh, we brought some of his artwork and then we also got him to do a mural in mount pleasant as well which i think is um it's right across the street from that uh urban rock brewery which i think is closing or has closed but it's it's in mount pleasant on really but one block east of canby on i think fourth avenue so if anyone wants to check that out it's a beautiful bright colored bear with geometric shapes by okuda and anyway we did one show then and then i became a father and so my cycles got even more uh difficult to have the bandwidth to put on more art shows so the following year after the second art rapture was called prohibition and at that point we called it art rapture presents prohibition so there was this beginning of a brand and consistency at that point for art rapture but the next year we did art rapture presents olavolo king queen's lover's fool who is a phenomenal female artist i think she's an absolute rock star one of the best artists in canada and i believe to be one of the most dominant female artists in in canada Ola Volo, who paints out of Montreal now. We did a solo show for her, which blew the lid off uh, in Railtown, Vancouver. And we sold every single piece, every single print. And uh, we had about 850 people show up for a solo event, which was, which was awesome. And then I came and stumbled across an artist, which seldom happens in my, in my sphere, where I see something and I have to work with that artist. They, Sean Jancy didn't have any representation. He'd barely sold any work, but I saw something special in what he was creating. And I went to his, his home studio and had a chat with him. Very nice guy. Met his wife, Lauren. And um, my wife and I got a piece by him. And then I said, look, man, I want to do a solo show for you too. And then we did a solo show for him in Yale Town in 2019. I was in 2018 as well, I think. And then we did another one in 2019. And it, it was a phenomenal experience just seeing someone become a true artist, you know, after sort of just painting in his home and barely selling anything and doing it more for pleasure. We, we created a real demand for his work and it elevated him as an individual and as an artist and creative output. And uh, we did a, two shows with him back to back years, you know, phenomenally well, I still work with Sean. I just talked to him on the phone today. And then Art Rapture took another step forward where we became a print publishing house. So we focus on fine art prints, not just sort of inkjet replicas of paintings, but creating fine art prints for the purpose of being enjoyed as a print. So really high quality paper, uh, really nice hand pulled screen prints and small limited editions, a couple variations with even more exclusive smaller editions. And we've become, you know, a, a relatively successful uh, printing publishing house with Art Rapture. And then we all evolved from there in the last two years and really jumped on board this digital collectible craze with NFTs and fine art and have uh, built up a, an amazing uh, distribution channel of, of NFTs for Olavolo, Sean Jancy, iHeart, Bill Higginson, um, and others through uh, nifty gateway as well as known origin and that's been a, a roller coaster ride of note no question about it but a hell of a journey <laughs> all right lots to dive into there uh <clears throat> first thing i want to ask you 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 started off by saying you came back from the cruise ships you went to some art shows you immersed yourself in the scene and you saw that it didn't present what you wanted you created these shows you had lineups of people the first one was you know street art and whatnot and all that kind of stuff how personally coming to your shows i know the scene is not what you would see at say the vancouver art gallery of you know moms and pops walking through and and checking out the art it's it's a very cool diverse scene of people at your shows how did that differ from when you came into the scene in 2015 or so when you came back from from the cruise ships to com 
to compared to where you're at now? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think that it's it's been <laughs> I haven't done a big show, uh, group show since 2017. So uh, to sp- speak honestly, I don't know what it would look like today. And I can maybe later on in this conversation, we can talk about what what 2023 has in store. But it's it, what I saw happen at the two back to back years of Art Rapture at the group shows is exactly what you said, this sort of high energy, youthful crowd ranging from sort of 18 years old to kind of 60 years old, but you know, really hovering in that, that sort of 25 to 40 year old range was probably the most common age group back then. A lot of that had to do with our network of people and, and, you know, leveraging as well, the great contacts and network of the volunteers and people that were associated with Art Rapture, and then also the artist networks. And how that differs from other stuff that I've seen is exactly what you say, you know, you, what we try to remove is the stuffiness of art. So art should be for everyone. And I think people get that vibe. It's very low pressure and very welcoming when you come to an art rapture show versus even myself as an art connoisseur, as a collector of artwork, I still feel somewhat intimidated going to some of the more, um, not popular, more upper crust galleries, even in Vancouver. And Vancouver galleries are not upper crust relative to what you'd see in New York and London and, and LA, but it's, it's this, this feeling of almost not belonging sometimes when you walk in these galleries. We at Art Rapture try to remove that completely. We want you to feel super comfortable. And I think that's what really differentiates us from other types of events. But then to compare what we sort of see now with Art Rapture, I think the the majority of the crowd, the majority of collectors, the majority of supporters of Art Rapture now are the same types of people and of the same ilk as what we've seen in the past for us. Amazing. I like to hear that. It's it's cool to see. Uh, it's cool to see the younger generation and the younger crowd as well, though, uh, dive into the scene because, like you said, art is for the person. And, and you're not there to necessarily just sell the artist, but you're selling the consumer as well, which is what you said. What I liked about what you heard, what you said a few minutes ago as well was that you talked about uh, a local artist named Sean Jancy, and you sort of I wouldn't say you found him, but you helped build him up. And I, you've done that with a few different local artists as well. Uh, talk about how rewarding that is for you, uh, finding these people and being able to present them to others. It's super rewarding. You know, that's, that's the best part for me is, is, is twofold. You know, seeing an artist flourish and feel rewarded for their efforts and acknowledged for the effort that they put to the table. And when you think about being an artist, which I'm not, right? Uh, I mean, I love art. I'm an art- artistic person, but I'm not an artist. I'm not creating paintings and putting it out there. When you look at the rawness of an artist, what it is, they're taking a piece of their soul, putting it onto canvas or sculpture, putting it out into the world, and becoming completely and utterly vulnerable for critique. And that's a big deal. You are opening yourself up to be absolutely criticized on you, on your soul, on your creativity. And so if something doesn't go well, like I can't imagine, it must just crush you. And so when we do a show and we think about it properly, we look at it methodically, we put all the right pieces of the puzzle together to give us the best chance for success. And the artist walks away with a successful show. It is absolutely rewarding to see how proud that artist is and how comfortable they feel in their own skin. The second part of it is the collector and seeing the joy in the collector's face to own a work of art and, and more importantly, when they get to meet the artist, right? That, that bond and connection between the artist and collector is, is something that's absolutely priceless to me. And, and, and I'm glad to be the conduit to make that happen. Well said. Um, off of that, you talked about your team. You talked about uh, a few buddies that sort of came together that that made the team Art Rapture. Is the the team the same size as it was in 
2016 when you first started or has it flourished? Yeah, I mean, we still stay super nimble, right? Because we don't have uh, consistent revenues that come in that warrant, you know, having full time staff. But the the general sort of support group is the same. So I'd I'd shout out to Dario Melli, who's who's uh, been you know partnered with Art Rapture since day one. Uh, he's a collector of our artists and you know a great confidant of mine. So uh, you know, mad thanks to Dario Melli and and everything he brings to the table, and then. Uh, you know, some of my other artist friends that bring a lot to the table from their perspective would be William D. Higginson, Olga Rybalko, Ola Volo, uh, I Heart, Sean Jancy, and those those individuals, you know, support Art Rapture in the way that they're always willing to work with us. One thing we don't do as well with Art Rapture is is do exclusivity. And a lot of galleries do, right? So it's like, if you want to be shown on my wall, you need exclusivity with me and no one else can sell your artwork but me for a year or two years or whatever. I don't believe in that. I believe in a trust-based model with performance. So if we will do well together, we're going to keep working well together. And if it doesn't work, I don't want to be beholden to you. Or if you don't like working with us in the style in which we bring to the table, you don't have to be bound to us either. And I think that creates the most genuine, honest approach to Art Rapture. So thank you to those artists for continuing to work with us and the friendship and trust that we've built together. And then more importantly, in terms of a, a size team, one thing we did uh, sort of uh, when we when we incorporated Art Rapture, which would have been February 2021 i want to say um we brought on board my old uh auctioneer buddy ryan watson out of ottawa and ryan is an absolute gem he is full of energy shares uh such an immense passion for art much like myself and of all things he actually trained me back in like 06 uh to be an auctioneer in in detroit and he's responsible for placing me on one of the biggest ships in the world which is where i learned underneath two phenomenal auctioneers tim findley and john block but more importantly he's also responsible for placing my wife on another ship which is why our two ships met up every single two weeks so if it weren't for ryan chances are there might not be our rapture we certainly wouldn't be our rapture but we might not even have uh my two daughters and my wife <laughs> well so Ryan is now what I call a co-curator and a confidant. And he's the kind of guy, even back in the first Art Rapture days, Jer, I'd call him up before we opened the doors on the first one and be like, Ryan, I got to tell you about this. Oh, blah, blah, blah. I can't believe I'm about to do this. And he just like, he just pumps you up and he's full of that real positive energy and and good passion and love for the, the field of art. And uh, happy to have Ryan on board as a co-curator with Art Rapture. I think diving back to that last, not this answer, but the answer before, I think you're doing yourself a bit of a disservice by saying you're not an artist because the the role of a curator is presenting the art in a very artistic way. Yeah, you know, and fair, man, like I'll, I'll, I'll take that. And I would say this when I do talk to artists and I kind of say like, I'm not an artist, maybe that's why I appreciate art so much. My blank canvas is the room. And so when we're putting on shows, we're not usually using gallery space. Sometimes we do, but it's more like, okay, how many pieces should we have in this show? Do we need to bring in other walls? Where should the lighting be? What should the flow be? What should the theme be? And then how do we make sure that all the art works uh, in synergy together to create this consistent experience and wonderful journey for the patron? And that really is my blank canvas. And so what I'm looking at, you know, 2023 and what to do for a show. Uh, that's where my artistic juices start to fly, where I'm like, which venue can I use? Who has a venue? And then how can I make the vision that I have work with the venue that might be available and then start to handpick the artist or group of artists to be a part of that, to make sure that there is a good flow and experience for the patron. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another thing you said there was uh, that it's super cool for the consumer to meet the artist. Now, one of the coolest experiences I've had, and I've seen him, I want to say five or six times, is when Jace Kim does a live art show. 
and yeah. he's there painting the the art live and these people are there watching him paint it and it goes from a blank canvas to literally the finished piece and then he auctions it off at the end or you auction it off at the end and the fact that these people have seen it go from nothing to what it is has to be the coolest thing ever because that's not a process that a lot of people get to see for sure man so uh jace shout out to him very very talented artist and he's ambidextrous right so that adds an additional uh level of entertainment when he's painting live too using both hands and it's hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around being skilled with both hands um so that that bodes well and i think you're right i mean people want to experience that work of art being created and you know as i'm sort of talking my wheels are turning maybe that's a good point to the artists listening to this podcast right now or other creatives listening to this podcast using the tools you have available to you such as instagram or TikTok or youtube um document your process of creation nothing that collectors like more when they can sort of search an artist and then find a platform that they're on and then witness what it takes to create a piece and that step-by-step -step process even if they're time-lapsed super quick um uh video releases of what you're doing or screen video capture of your uh pencil working on an ipad as an example whatever it is us collectors we want to see that stuff and you know if any of my artists are listening to this podcast shout, shout out to you too like i want to own your sketches i want to get some of that early stuff that's just like super raw and not even finished product because that really excites me and i think you know, it's important that artists share the process, not just the finished product. So thanks for bringing up Jace Kim. No worries. That's that's an interesting thing. And and that might be something that, that people could dive into as well. You know, selling their sketches rather than just the finished product. Uh, or even better, like you've got a great collector, VIP collector. Send them a Christmas card with a sketch in it. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, um, or when they buy a painting you know, give them a couple little ink sketches that they've done, anything like that. I mean, the, the value of that type of 100%, it makes you just as a collector, really fall in love with that individual. And you'll likely buy more. Yep. All right. You well, said sure, think, Jared, like when you look at when artists are like, you know, how do we sell more more paintings? It's like, well, whoever's bought paintings from you before are probably going to buy another. So oh, yeah. You gotta focus on your existing base. And then, uh, too long of a conversation for today, but but artists need to get into the USA market. Van like Vancouver artists got to get out of here. You got to get your art exposed into that American market. That's where you're going to really see yourself catapult forward. All right. You said you hadn't done a big show, uh, like a big group show in, in some time. You have done a few small shows, uh, one of which was finding local artists that hadn't been seen before. And like I said, you, you said Sean Jancy is a guy that you brought up. Uh, this other show you did, I believe, was that actually William D. Higginson and Olga's space in yep. uh, Yale Town, where they yep. used to have their space. And you did a show where it featured artists that weren't very well known. How cool was that? Yeah, that was a show called 2230. And so obviously we get a lot of direct messages of artists that want to work with us. And, you know, it's really hard for me to find the bandwidth and cycles to bring on new talent. So I came up with this idea where we blend some of our existing artists and, and accomplished artists in conjunction with some lesser known artists, artists that are still talented, but maybe haven't had the platform to get their work out there. And so we created this show called 2230, which was art about the size of um, of this uh, Jason Dussault print here. And the theme was uh, about 30 artists, each contributing one work of art to the show, 22 inches by 30 inches on paper. And it went really well. And it was like peak COVID when we did this show. So it, that brought some new challenges to putting on a show. Uh, but it went really well. And I don't think anyone got COVID. So that was like a huge bonus. And it allowed us to bring a lot of different artists together, different styles together, but still themed around this whole concept of 2230. And I'm thinking of taking a model similar to that, Jer, for next year. 
Interesting. I've had you on here for about 45 minutes now. I won't keep you for a hell of a lot longer, but let's dive into 2023. Uh, you said we could move forward through there and, and talk about what you got going on. I know you spoke about, you know, the NFTs and the Web3. I'm sure that's going to blow up a little more in 2023. You got any big projects that are going to come about that you can sort of speak to now? Yeah, so... Uh, one thing for sure, you know, we've put a lot of time into the NFT space the last 18, 24 months. And with the market conditions as they are, we want to make sure that we're not neglecting the roots of what Art Rapture is, which is the physical fine art. So in 2023, we're still going to have some digital work available through Nifty Gateway and Known Origin. But the primary focus is going to be on physical art for 2023. That'll include a minimum of two print runs. One, we're going to be working with an international artist who I absolutely adore his work, Kia Tama. We're going to do a print run with him. His studio is based out of New York, but he's originally from South Africa. He has already sent us the images of what we're going to do. I'm working with the printing house right now to make sure that we're getting the highest quality hand-pulled silkscreen prints that we can that we can achieve. We're going to have several different variations of it, hand-signed limited edition prints, and we're going to release those at some point in the first quarter of 2023. And then we're also going to do, for the first time ever, a full color hand pulled silk screen print by Ola. For those of you that know the prints we've done with Ola before, they've predominantly only been single color or two color silk screen prints. This one is going to be far more involved with multiple colors into that screen print, which means a lot more effort on the printing house. Um, and a lot more um, vibrancy in the artwork. And we're really, really excited about that print run with Ola. I, I would say March, April is probably the time frame when that print run is going to be released. And then for a physical show, Jer, I've had this concept in my mind for years. And I probably would have done it during COVID. Uh, but, you know, we need to make sure we have a packed house for this. And... I don't mind sharing a bit of details around it. I don't have the artist roster finalized yet. It'll likely be in September or October in 2023. But the concept is the throwback. And what I want to do is bring in 7 to 10 artists maximum and have each artist contribute one or two original paintings that are heavily inspired by a work of art, series of artworks, or artist that has heavily influenced their work and create their own interpretation of that series of paintings or artwork. So they're almost giving acknowledgement and respect to the past, creating their own style of that specific work of art, showcase these paintings in a very well-lit uh, environment, and then do that whole art rapture group show style where we got a bar, we've got a DJ, we have a lot of fun, and uh, we have you know a ton of people come through to scope this art out. Beautiful. Those print runs, uh, is there a time frame for those? Yeah, so first print run with will be with Kia Tama. Uh, that handle is at K-E-Y-A-T-A-M-A. -A -A, and that'll happen in the first quarter of, of, of 2023. So... Depends when the prints are done and uh, the marketing comes out. I would say likely February. And then the Ola Volo print will likely be March or April. And we'll probably do one or two other print runs, but we haven't solidified who they'll be with. I'm excited for 2023. It sounds like a bang, man. Uh, I got to ask uh, before we wrap things up here. Uh, you're talking about physical art. You said it's going to, you know, 2023 is going to be focused on physical art. What are your thoughts on this uh, AI artwork stuff that's been going on these days? Man, good question. You know, it's it's hard for me to even really truly provide accurate commentary on it. But my sort of first initial thoughts are an artist isn't necessarily someone who is putting the paint on canvas or who is putting the pen on paper. An artist is the visionary. And so I have no problems with AI if the person that is allowing the AI to generate work is truly leveraging it as a tool to create their vision. So 
when you look at going way back in the day, if you look at Michelangelo and you look at the Sistine Chapel, we all know it's Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. But did he paint it? Sure, he painted some of it. But he also had dozens of other people painting it. And so we need to know sort of where that line is. And AI blurs that line of, is this truly, if I'm using it as a tool, is this truly my vision? Or is the AI engine creating the vision and it's not really my artwork? We aren't really going to know the answer to that question. I think what is most important is that we treat it as a tool. Some artists are doing it brilliantly, like absolutely brilliantly, where the work is unique. They're leveraging the algorithms. They're leveraging the technology as a tool to assist them in creating their vision absolutely fine other people might just log on and just like let it spit something out and then say it's theirs so it really it 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 depends and i think what's important is that as we as patrons and viewers of it that we sort of ask the question you know how did you use the tool um you know what was your vision here what are you trying to allow that tool to interpret for you and i see no problem with taking bits and pieces of it to assist you in, in allowing you to speed process up and, and get to a result that is desired for you. But you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting game out there, man. <laughs> <laughs> that it is a uh, final question for you before we wrap things up here. Uh, you got plenty of local talent uh, or Canadian talent, whatnot on your back wall there behind you. Um, you spoke about plenty of local artists as well. Uh, for the people out there listening that may not know, uh, tell me one local artist that people should keep their eye on that they may not know about. Hmm. Hard to leave it at one, but I would I say... Know, I know, it's not really fair either because, you know, someone might hear it and be like, hey, why didn't you say me? Totally. Well, I would say go to artrapture.com and check out the roster of some of the artists we've represented. All of them are fantastic. Um... I'm very, very bullish on William D. Higginson because he's local. I would obviously say Ola, but she's in Montreal. So I'll, I'll, I'll pull Bill into this one for, for Vancouver. And the reason why I pick William D. Higginson is that there is no other artist I have met personally that has the dedication to his craft that he has. It is this constant pursuit of improvement every painting must be better than the past one and constantly firing on all cylinders driving home talent and precision and execution into each and every one of his paintings not surrealism isn't for everyone but i can tell you this if you're a fan of surrealism you must look at william d higginson it is astonishing what he accomplishes with oil painting on canvas and the stories and depth of what he brings to the table so on that note, you know, I'm very, very bullish on William D. Higginson. Awesome. Uh, I took up about an hour of your time here, Paul. I, it's been an absolute blast. It's been a blast from the past for some of it. <laughs> uh, I had a great time. I'm glad that you were the first uh, guest on, I'll, I'll call it season two of the Wonder Brand show. Uh, you mentioned artrapture.com, but before I let you go here, just let people know where they can find you and everything you got going on social media, man. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Jeremy. First of all, thank you so much for having me on the Wonder Brand show. I absolutely love your hook on it too with the Wonder Bread style logo. I think it's fucking brilliant, man. Um, and I uh, really appreciate you having me on. So the way people can connect with myself is uh, Instagram, just at Art Rapture. On Twitter is at Art underscore Rapture. And also on Twitter for me personally is Chief Curator. With the last O in curator is 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 a zero as opposed to the letter O. So uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, still looking at TikTok and might start getting into that a little bit. I'll let Ryan Watson pull that decision whether we want to leverage that or not. And um, you know, email you can email me. And if you're anyone out there who just either wants to know more about an artist and want to collect them, email me. If you're an artist and you just want some advice. I'm always happy to jump on a Zoom. I don't have a lot of time for physical meetings outside of my schedule, but you know, I'll, I'll always try to make time for a phone call or or a Google Meet or a Zoom. 
Um, and my email is paul.becker at artrapture.com. He is Paul Becker. I'm Jeremy Brand. This was the Wonder Brand Show. Peace out. Peace, dude. Thank you so much. It's been a blast.